Welcome to the Ad Tech Heroes podcast. Each episode features an interview with today's leaders in advertising technology. If you're working in ad tech and always wanted to sit down and pick the brains of today's experts, then this show is for you. Subscribe and join us each week as we meet a new ad tech hero. Hello and welcome to the Ad Tech Heroes podcast. In today's episode, we are going to talk about who should own the ad stack, and I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Birkby. Hello, Matthew. How's it going? It's going well, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. I, I noticed those, uh, um, is it skateboards in the back you've got in your house? There are a lot of skateboards in the back on my uh, on my back walls. Sadly, uh, I don't skate as much as I used to, but uh, I still buy boards, which is it's a strange thing. Nice. I had to rip down the balloons five minutes earlier from, from the wall because it was my son's birthday. <laughs> A few days ago, so there was a Spider-Man themed um, themed um, party we had for him, uh, and actually with the Ad Tech Heroes theme as well, I've actually got his Spider-Man headphones in. So you know, I thought stay with the, the theme of heroes and Ad Tech Heroes. Oh, it's working! It's working. I, I think I think you could milk that every episode now. I know, I know. I was thinking about that. You know, each episode maybe. Uh, you know, having a cape on or something, I don't know, but maybe that's too ex- excessive, but uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> but it's food for thought, food for that thought. That works for me. Uh, but no, thank you. Thank you for jumping on the podcast episode today. Super excited to talk to you. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to, let's, uh, yeah, let's kickstart with your career uh, and tell us uh, where you, you know, where you've been and how you've got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been uh, in the in the marketing world in some form or another for I hate to say this, 20 plus years, started off a very small company, as I'm sure lots of people did. And it was, I suppose, the time of um, the first, God, this is aging me so badly, the first dot-com bubble. And at that time, taught myself to code because that particular company needed a website. So a bit of JavaScript, a bit of CSS, HTML, and a bit of ActionScript and Flash way back when. Um as happened to many organizations at that moment, the bubble very much burst and that company went under, but the skills I picked up there took me into a, a much larger B2B e-commerce company and to help them with their rollout from 16 markets into, God, it was 30 plus, I seem to recall. And as part of that, uh, brought in search, did a lot of search with them early, early, um, did a little bit of CRM helped them to bring in actually a, uh, an email provider at the time they were, and I won't name them, but they were running their email program on a, on a machine under a desk in IT, which wow. probably wasn't the right approach, but uh, yes, we won't talk about how that happened. And then um, I, I found my way to EA, um, where I spent actually the bulk of my career. So I started off in conceptually what was online comms, um, but that was really helping them with their web CRM and actually early online display campaigns, working directly with the media agency there. And from that moment, did lots of different things with them, did a bit of content marketing, did a bit of YouTube stuff, traveled around to lots of different studios, found myself more and more drawn into the media space um, and actually helped them in-house search and social to begin with, then some programmatic, and went to the US for a little bit. Um, with them to lead media planning on half of the portfolio and then came back to set up EA's in-house activation team in Europe to mirror what we had running in North America. And then I find through how many pivots and twists, I find myself leading that particular organization's in-house media function globally across um, strategy planning, activation, and um, and then from there, made the leap that most other people don't do, is I leapt to the agency side, found myself at uh, Mindshare, helping them out on a number of clients, and um, I'm now uh, with the IPG Media Brands Group. So yeah, quite a, quite a journey, like you said, most of it um, across EA. How how is it the difference been between working client side and, and agency side? Is there are there many differences? Well, everyone always says that there's, there's like, it, it's a vast difference. It, it's, it's not, um, you know, there, there are similar challenges, um, from a people, from a resourcing perspective, 
I think the major difference that I've found is um, on the agency side, you are or certainly on the media agency side, you're living and breathing media. The entire agency group is doing that. And you have a resource of individuals who know so many things. On the client side, you're within a specialist function and you are the expert. And so you, you will likely rely on your media agency. And so you don't have the resource of, and it sounds odd to say, the resource of people. You know, the agencies have touched so many different things and have so many different people and brains that are w within the agency group that just don't exist quite in the same way on the client side. The flip to that is on the client side, you're the ultimate decision maker. Mm -hmm. And on the agency side, you're not. And ultimately, while you can recommend things, it is the client that makes the ultimate decision. And those are probably the two major things. That, that really separate the, the two. And it's been, it's been fascinating to, to make the, the, the jump from, from the, the client to the agency side. Now, how did you adjust with that shift? Because I can imagine being client side for so long, you were the gatekeeper of knowledge, right? So people would come to you within the organization uh, and then you joined an agency, um, you know, a big agency as well. So it's not like you, you joined a small boutique agency where you would have then had lots of people with different, you know, varies of a uh, variety of experiences. So yeah. How did you adjust with that? How would that, how, how, did, how did that, how did that affect you? I think the, I think that oddly, so the, the flip to the, well, not the flip, but like the, the adjustment was really that if you've worked at a company for a very long time, you just know how basic things work. You just know who to go to for things. And I found myself on, on the agency side. I didn't know how anything worked. Mm -hmm. So even the most basic things of um, like the, I don't know, how to, how to do your timesheets. You don't do timesheets on the client side. Who knew, who, who knew this was a thing, but the actual, the, the, the major difference really was, was the adjustment to, I had, whereas on the, the agencies, the client side, I was that expert. I, gatekeepers, a strong word. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, it probably wouldn't be one that I would know. I think the the difference was um, I actually found it kind of liberating in that I had this group of people around me. And once I started to build my, my network of people that I knew, I would know who to go to um, and talk to. And it was actually from, a, from someone who was sort of fascinated by the media space, having all these smart people around me was just like, wow. Um, and so, whereas, you know, it was somewhat liberating in that I didn't have to make the ultimate decision, frustrating at times as well, but having all of these people, it felt like I had an army of people around me that I could just go and talk to. Um, and that, that was fascinating. I would be lying if I didn't say that I got frustrated and get frustrated at times, but my job now is as a, I suppose, a, a consultant and advisor. Um, a trusted advisor at that and and likely you know having sat in the the client's shoes i kind of know or i, I have uh, i suppose a, an empathy for 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 what they may be going through in their day to day that um if you've spent your entire career on the agency side you think you know but you don't really know um and that probably sets me aside from 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 most people that was a long and winding road of an answer for you no 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 that was perfect and 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 do you see yourself ever making the full circle and, and going on the vendor side you're probably not looking at it now because you've just joined the the agency world but yeah do you, do you see yourself going on that side as well or the dark side like a lot of people like to call it i uh, and and people really shouldn't call it the dark side so we'll just say that we shouldn't we shouldn't call it that i think um so never say never I think the it would have to be a technology that just blows me away and that I am so fascinated with. Like if you ask me, am I going to go and join a DSP tomorrow? That's just not going to happen. Um, like great people, and I love what what happens over there. And I, you know, I know I know people um, at DB three hundred and sixty. I know I know people at Trade Desk. I know them personally. Great people. The technology isn't something that's that's like. Yeah. Whereas if there was something, I don't know, in the creative space or even the analytics space, I was just like, yeah, this is, this has got me so excited. Then, then, then maybe, but 
not in the coming year, that's for sure. No, that, no, that makes and sense. And I say year because obviously the space moves so quickly that I wouldn't want to look further than a year, 18 months. And just on that point of, you know, calling it the dark side, I, I, I do have that conversation with agency folk. Um, and the first, the kind of like the most popular response is, oh, well, I'm no good at sales. I don't like sales, so I can't see myself media owner side. And I think I have to spend so much time t- trying to convince them. It's not, first of all, there's there are other jobs than just sales within mm-hmm. media owners. Um, but also I think sales is probably, and you, you, you probably know better than me, I've seen sales approach has definitely changed over the last 10, 15 years, whether it's, you know, more, there's more ad tech, more technology, it's more consultative data led rather than out and out sales. I don't know if you, you would agree with that. I think I would. I think, um, you know, you go back 15 years and it definitely, it definitely felt salesy. Let, let's be honest. And, and no one likes that necessarily that approach i would say over the last few years certainly the vendors that um do well and the publishers that do well it's definitely a collaborative approach and it's definitely attempting to understand the challenge that the the client and i I suppose the agency group are going through the vendors specialize in that area and they've built whatever the are you going to probably shoot me for saying this Built whatever widget it is that you need to plug into your thing, whatever the thing is, and it can be in any part of of an organization. And if the vendors and the publishers and the providers can understand those challenges and approach it like that, then I I think they do well. I I was listening to a B two B podcast the other day, and it name escapes me, but um, you know, it's not a quick sale anymore necessarily for some some systems. It's a it's a it's it's a relationship building moment and then and you know that relationship is really centered on trying to understand what it is that the client the agency is is attempting to overcome and it's usually a problem in some regard otherwise company would do it themselves yeah. um so you know i think there's a place for everybody but nobody wants that old fashioned way of selling definitely and i think there's a lot more competition now maybe versus 15 years ago whether you had your big portals or your publishers and there was less um kind of ad tech so where you would you know you'd have a finite amount of media owners to work with and therefore you know it was more salesy or massively relationship based rather than product led or performance led because if you've mm-hmm. got arguments say the the biggest publication with the largest amount of scale and the performance was low you'd still have to work with them because there's no other option, right? Yep, that's fair. I'm not that's naming fair. any names, of um, course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Now, I think, you know, it's interesting that you, you talk about product and ultimately it is the product. You know, you can have the great, the best relationships in the world, but if the product doesn't stand up and it fails on, on you for whatever reason, then at that moment in time, you've just kind of destroyed the relationship. It's hard to build and very quick to... to uh, did it destroy in some regards destroy is a horrible word but you but you but you know what i mean yeah so kind of in your role where we where you were at uh you know working in-house at the client side it'd be great to understand where you saw and the successes and failures in bringing ad tech in-house because i know you you did a lot of work yourself mm-hmm. but also relied on the agency um and media, uh, media vendors at the same time so it'd be good to understand Kind of the pros and cons of of bringing ad tech in house. I think um, you know to to that on the, those pros and cons. I th- the first thing I would say, and this is not an original thought, but by any means, is it does it does depend on the situation that you're in and what you, what you're looking for. For for a a period of time, I was of the opinion that everything should be brought in house. And I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the right way now. I, I think in days gone by where relationships between agency in particular and client were maybe lopsided a little and the agency held a, a lot of um, influence and power over, over the data in particular. Um, and there was a moment where you know, obviously transparency was a, was a hot topic in the space. And so the simplest way to improve transparency was to attempt to bring everything in-house. I think the challenge is, and some of the 
the implications are, you know, the complexity of the contracts, you know, and, and you as a, as a brand are unlikely to have the same influence necessarily as, a, as an agency group. Um, so the complexity of the contract. And then more importantly, actually, and, and we don't think about this, it's just the maintenance and the management and the installation and the, the running of whatever it is. You can, you know, if you think about from an ad tech point of view, if you bring a piece of technology in, that's great. And everyone gets super excited about it. And there's like, everyone's enthused by this thing. Give it 18 months. How's it being maintained? Who's, you know, is it maintained with some sticky tape and whatever? Or is it like, is there a proper um, MarTech roadmap, uh, which includes lifecycle of that road, of, of that ad tech stack? So I would say that that's probably the, the biggest challenge is actually just the ongoing understanding and maintenance. And from there, and then that rolls into people and the people that you have and the ongoing resource that you have, because it always requires people to to um, uh, ensure that you've, you've got that up and running. From a success point of view, though, you know, I, I don't know whether I would define this as a success, more as understanding the the stack that you have the data flow and the publishers and the media vendors that you work with internally um, on the client side, that is invaluable. You can have proper conversations, proper adult conversations within the three, what, you know, the, with the media vendor, with the agency, with it, like all of those individuals as a client, you can have proper conversations and that leads you then to much better outcomes. So, you know, I would say that those are the, the, the elements of, of success that, that I've seen and I know that that's super vague but I think that it's it's imperative for a client to have a level of understanding not that an agency would try and or a vendor would try and pull the wool over your eyes but you want to be able to have those honest and open conversations do you think there's a, I was just thinking do you think there's an additional variable involved when you're hiring talent in-house that they, because they're only working on one brand, the, the people that you hire need to be invested in the brand or, you know, interested in the brand. Whereas an agency, a lot of cases, you wouldn't know what brand you work across, especially media owner side. You don't know what, you know, will take up most of your time. I thought, is, is that something that you look at when you're hiring in, in-house? Um, not necessarily. Okay. And certainly I didn't. You know, I would say that, you know, I would want to a diverse group of people, some that play, some that, you know, on the, and, and I'm going to talk very specifically about my own experience. You know, I wasn't looking for a group of people that all necessarily play games. I want the right type of people. And I want, um, I suppose I was always looking for people who were in, innately curious about what we were doing mm -hmm. and could see that this was a passionate business that we worked in. Uh, but they didn't necessarily have to, um, love every single title or even play. And I would argue that, um, you know, not every business, um, on, you know, somebody somewhere um, is going to sell a, a thing that they don't particularly love, but they like the people that they work mm -hmm. with. They like the team that they work on. I think the, the thing to know is that, um, on the client side, you know, you're not going to work on multiple brands all the time on the agency you you there's probably more capability there and i would say that probably for the hiring managers on the client side you really need to think about the career pathing and it's i know this is what, what weren't what, wasn't what we're coming on to talk about but career pathing on 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 the client side is um critically important particularly when you're working with in-house teams you need to kind of get the balance right and have a, a view of where people may go because, you know, the agencies on the agency side, there's, there's just multiple things that you could work on. Whereas, you know, we're a particularly niche group on the, mm. on the client side. I would say though, I always have the ultimate plan of seeding media folk all across, all, all across the client's business. Um, I want people that understand media. Um, and how it works in multiple parts of a, of a client's business. Yeah, I think it's, it's a refreshing way to 
think about it, especially for our listeners that are looking to take that jump into client side. And like you said, it's usually agency to, to, to client side that we do see. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, some of them might not feel um, they might not like the role or feel they have the right skill set, but maybe think that's a barrier that, you know, the, the interviewer will think, this person needs to know a lot about this brand or really invested in this brand. So I think that's quite refreshing to hear that in not all cases, this is this is the case. I don't think it is the case in all cases. I, th- I would argue you, you want a group of diverse individuals um, and diversity of thought is equally as important mm-hmm. as diversity in other areas. And if everybody, like if, if everybody, if I'd recruited an entire team of people who just played, I know it's not called this now, but it was in my day, who just played FIFA. Mm-hmm. That would make for a boring group of individuals. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, the I suppose the million-dollar question is who should own what in the ad stack? Uh, and, yeah, I'd love to get your take on that. I think it. I think there are... So there are areas, obviously, where first-party data lives and, and, and breathes, and clearly... Anything that's vague, that's that's associated with that in some way, regard or other, should clearly be owned by by the client. I would, I think it depends on how much money you spend, and I think it also depends on. You know, if we bring it back to the people again, um, what you see the people who might be running those particular elements doing. Now, it is possible within that ad stack that you just own the contract. And the agency sits on the seat for you if we, you know, within that, within the buying construct of that. So I don't think, and everyone's going to tell me to get off the fence, but it's, it is what it is. I think it, it depends on the type of organization that you are and what you really want to get out of the stack. So I don't think any more, like if you'd have asked me this question in 2017, I would have 100% said to you, the client should own as much as possible. And I would have been adamant at the time that that is the right way forward. I'm less adamant now on that, um, and I think it's it it is de- it does depend. I think you know one of the interesting areas for you to look at when you're thinking about your ad stack is actually the relationship that you have with your agencies. How confident are you in your agency relationship? You know, is it a collaborative and consultative relationship? Is it a transactional relationship? Do you just want the agency to push the buttons for you and you own the paper? Do you feel that you'll get the right the right terms with the the the, the provider of whatever it is? There are some elements where you know there is no necessarily there's not necessarily the buying power that um, the holding companies necessarily have. Um, or there may be some things that you know you could argue that. The brand safety piece, as an example, you know, a marketer's job is to somewhat grow the brand and be protective of the brand. So you would argue potentially within that that situation, and if you have the right level of, of influence, that you should own the brand safety piece. Should you own the DSP? That's um that's a that's a solid question. And I think it depends on what you're trying to get out of owning the owning the DSP. And how many you want, if I'm really honest with you, you know, the days of a, having a singular DSP where everything lives in mm-hmm. one, one, one little world, um, those days have probably gone, probably. So that was a really rough answer for you. No, no, I think it was perfect. And, and, and what I'm interested in is, does, do you think then it requires some sort of audit where you really have a look at? kind of resources that you have, what you can pump in in terms of budgets, also looking at where you are in terms of technology, what you want to achieve, you know, requiring an audit and then seeing how much of the ad stack you should own. And do you think this happens enough um, on the client side? I, I would, I think you're right. I think the, you know, you would probably think about this on some sort of maturity scale mm-hmm. and, and you would work through, through, through that. Does the audit happen enough? with probably the the depth that you're looking for based on whatever your objectives might be it may not probably doesn't i think the the element is with the audit or 
sort of a, I suppose, a maturity uh, approach when, when you look at it is I don't think it can sit still. Mm. So I think you you need to have a time scale for revisiting that audit because there will be moments, because the, the landscape is changing so rapidly at the moment, there will be moments where you'll you'll want to adjust. And you probably, I would argue, within the the framework that you have for your stack, what you want to think about is actually flexibility. And that's flexibility to be in and out of house or even mid-house if you want to. I don't even know what you would call it, owning your own contracts, but having the agency run, run the run the actual buying for you you know you might think about that as I don't know, some sort of hybrid model and that's probably to a certain extent a model that works for a reasonable number of businesses makes sense um, you mentioned there are brands and agencies that use multiple dsps we've obviously seen some mm -hmm. unfortunately you know go bust like the, the likes of media map yep. announcement very, very recent do you think that will change and there will be more consolida consolidation? Because I'm also thinking about SPO and brands trying to get closer to, to, to the users and looking at all the different players within that chain. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that, that's my question to you. I, I wonder, I think if you were to look at the plane, I wonder if on the more on the, the sell side, like I, I suspect there should be some consolidation in some regards down there. I would hope and I worry that if we were to do that at the, the DSP point, like, you know, we've seen it already with the stagnation of innovation in that space, that if, if everything was consolidated, that you lose the potential for innovation. Um, and, you know, I've mentioned Trade Desk already. I think that, you know, having them as a viable player with DV360 at the moment, wherever, and and who knows what will happen in, in that space, it just helps to push each other. You need competitors in some regard. It's just competitive in what regard. I'm, I, I would want some choice. Yeah, and if there's value generated from competition, right? Completely. Because I think I think that's the key thing. Competition should, in theory, drive value, um, not just price. Doesn't just mean bringing the price down, but just genuine no, value, service, no. and product, and uh, research and development as well. Completely. It, it's we need a healthy ecosystem, but we also need to be mindful of where the fees go. Just to be blunt, because you know when you start to look. It's uh, it can get quite shocking. Yeah, and 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 I think a lot more brands are asking for that transparency now in terms of, like I said, the mm -hmm. value that each each vendor is bringing, or or you know whether it's data, whether it's inventory, whether it's measurement, whatever it might be, brand safety, completely uh, the value that they're bringing. I think that's super important, and and we'll, I think we'll continue to see that in twenty to twenty four. In terms of relationships within our industry, which which do you think are the most important? So, and, and this is a biased view because I don't, haven't sat on the vendor side, but I do think the relationship between agency and client is super critical. You need an inherent amount of trust between those two partners to then feed the ecosystem. So I, I would argue that those are super important to enable the ecosystem to you know, trust starts at that first that first contact point. Now, if the relationship isn't strong between the agency and the client, then I would argue that it likely becomes weaker and weaker within the broader within the broader ecosystem of 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 how we operate. That's not to say that um, the relationships with vendors are not important. They are. They're super important. And certainly, you know, we've done interest. Oh, we, I've done companies that I've worked with have done interesting things directly with vendors. And I think it's interesting for vendors and publishers to talk directly with clients because sometimes, you know, there's nuance in the language that might come out from, from agency. And I think as well, you know, it's, you know, I said this, it's helpful for us all to understand all of our own challenges and, and problems, but the agency and client relationship I would argue is is likely the most critical. 
Yeah, I, I'd agree. And just kind of touching on your point, even for me, I've always worked uh, me drone aside for about 14 years. And I would still say the agency and, and client relationship is the most important. And it's for that point you made at the end was there's, there's times where as a media owner, we've pitched to agencies. And then when we speak to the client, there's, it's a bit like Chinese whispers, you know, it's, the, the messaging gets a bit distorted um, going through different channels. So I think as long as the agency is always keeping up to, you know, the client up to date on, on whether it's media owners in this example, I think that's, that, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you there. Um, how do then, would you say, how would you say vendors, agencies, and clients can add, add value across, across that chain? Well, I, th I think, so ultimately we have to go back to what we're trying to do, you know, and, and, to some regards, we're, we're all trying to grow the brands that we work for, but actually we, you know, we are somewhat, for, it doesn't matter what product we are, we are somewhat in service of providing a thing, service, whatever, that our c customers, consumers, players, whatever you want to be, needs, wants. So we always have to have that, that sort of North Star in our mind. But ultimately, I think the, the value that the, the client adds it's clearly the relationships directly with their consumers. Um, I think there's interesting trends that, that come out in the utilization of whatever product might be that would potentially help vendor and agency to understand that client more. I think the, 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 the vendors, publishers, they know how people interact with their product thing, whatever it is, the widget within their, their space, I think the value that they add is, you know, there's insight. If you think about it, we're all operating in this broader ecosystem mm -hmm. of everything that, that's happening. We've all got somewhat of a lens, but, and there's a little bit of overlap, but there is, there's an element of our lenses that only we see uh, and that, 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 that we can look at. And if, if we actually thought about those three parts, that's what helps us build up a much bigger picture of the end user, player, client, uh, whoever it is, whoever it might be. And I think that that's the fascinating piece is actually everyone adds an element of insight and that insight then goes to build whatever the product is for the, the person in the chain. And we are in a chain or an ecosystem. And I think it, it's, if you were to look at it agnostically, it's our slice that brings the value for everybody. The agency has a slice. You definitely have a view. You see how behavior is happening and the client does as well. And if we can bring those together, obviously in a privacy safe manner, in a very privacy safe manner, if we can bring those together, then we can build richer, you know, a richer insight into, into our end users. And then from there, we can help to improve whatever it is that we're trying to do for them, whether it's their experience, whether it is indeed even the products that they utilize. What are your what are your predictions uh, for 2024 in ad tech? It would be somewhat remiss of me not to start with the two letters. I was about to say letters. that. I was about to literally say, <laughs> will that be the first thing that comes out? <laughs> I think what's interesting about those two letters, um, and that's clearly AI for everybody and not direct response, as, as <laughs> some people may, you know, like, yeah. he's clearly talking about DR though, isn't yeah, he? He's talking clearly. about DR. No. <laughs> It's clearly, um, but I think that, I think the interesting thing is for, for some of us in our industry, you know, probably if you were to look at the hype curve, you know, we're, we're a little ahead of most people. I think what, what's interesting this year is we are, I think we're going to start to see more practical application in some regards. And I think that's probably what everybody within the, the ecosystem that we operate in is looking at is like, okay, that's great. Everyone got excited. Everyone's played around with chat GPT. They've probably been on Dali or mid journey or wherever it is. You know, I've been making lots of pictures of Cocker Spaniels on skateboards because that's, it's amazing what you can do, <laughs> but that's not a very practical use case, unless that's a particular game that you're concept arting for. I do think that there's going to be some interesting areas around vision, particularly computer vision and AI and bringing together some regards of the data that we currently have and the creatives that we're running and pulling them together in some regards to, to have the models start to predict what may or may not be 
useful creative for us. Now, I don't know where we're at with those sort of things, but I do think that that's, that's an interesting space. Clearly, you know, we all sit on mounds and mounds of, of number-based data. The humans mm -hmm. just struggle with delivering any kind of meaningful insight out of. And then I do think that we'll start to see people utilize far more those data sets with some sort of learning model on top, mm -hmm. um, which then I think will then start to feed far more, more predictive attribution in some regards. You know, if we think about the fact that the signals are declining, di disappearing, going away, you blend those two together and I think you got something kind of interesting. So I think that's, that, that, that's one. I think that then bleeds me into the data space. Mm -hmm. I'm a big uh, fan's probably the wrong word. I have been a champion of the, the usage of bringing clean rooms into people's ad tech stack for a while now. I think live ramp purchasing Habu is kind of interesting. I think what InfoSum's doing with its private path mm -hmm. is interesting and that space is only going to hot up. And what that probably bleeds into is actually, I think people will start to think about data collaboration far more when they start signing um, partnership deals yep. with publishers, with whoever it might be. So vendor X with CPG brand Y in some regards, you know, you won't just think about putting your thing on the can of whatever that thing would be. You'd start to think about how you bring those two pieces of data together, to, together the two, those two data sets in a privacy safe manner to glean more interesting insights on each of your users. And I think that's why, while it's not an original thought, I think the clean room space this year is going to be like, people are going to start to go, ah, yeah, we could start using this. And obviously it's, you know, coming off the back of CES, yep. um, Disney's talk, you know, Disney have been way ahead on this for a long time, certainly in North America. I think we'll see that come out elsewhere. I'm really impressed with with what they've been doing. And then probably I think this is this is our old prediction. And it's one that people have been saying probably for the last 10 years. But I think the, and I touched a little bit on creative earlier. I do think the bringing together of creative and media together mm -hmm. and having those functions that, that create, I think bringing them together earlier, we'll start to see that emerge far more strongly. And I do wonder... Um, what the holding companies will do to to facilitate that far more um, because i think it's it's critical we 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 play in such a i suppose a you know i know we talked about transparency earlier but we play in it in a, it's odd particularly in the media world like we, we, we're looked at so much we have so much data and the media functions are always somewhat analyzed critiqued by the rest of the business and rightly so because invariably those functions spend I don't know, up to 80 percent of of investment what i would love to see more is okay it's not just the media plan creative plays as in fact it plays a much bigger role than placement and all of those other elements so how do we bring the two together more and i think you'll see you know people have talked about this trend but we spent years of years breaking them apart i think this is the year where we'll start to see that more acutely spoken about and we've talked about it in in previous podcasts where it shouldn't just be a one-size-fits-all approach where the creative nope. is built and then that exact creative is launching on different platforms whether it's tv you know digital out of home whether it's uh, open web app app based so is that is that kind of what you're alluding to that you know the, the creative needs to come up in more conversations and it needs to drive i suppose I maybe earlier conversations with you know the bigger picture and collaborating with the media owners and agencies i think there's an element of that um there's an element of if you put a bunch of smart people in a room together with slightly different specialisms mm -hmm. but have a little you know some understanding of each other's specialisms really interesting things happen mm -hmm. and so if you do that earlier in whatever your your process is and you have them speak, start speaking the same language and understanding the same things, then yes, um, interesting things will happen. Clearly, we want to make, you know, we shouldn't be using the same creative everywhere. Many brands have talked about building the right creative for the right platform at the right moment. Um, there are things that will work well on TikTok. Let's pick on them. 
that won't necessarily work quite so well in your in your in your classic sort of VOD environment. But if you build it specifically in the language of whatever the platform is, um, I think you'll have something quite interesting to to work with. And equally, I think the performance of that, whatever your performance metric is, um, will definitely improve. For sure. Um, we always finish our podcast episodes with this question, so I'd love to get your take on it. If you had a superpower in ad tech, what would it be? Well, apart from having a cape or some Spider-Man headphones that let me hear with like the power of of spiders, which I'm clearly, which is why you're wearing them today. Um, no, I, uh, I quite like the concept. I don't know how this power manifests itself, but I'd like the power of super connection. So like I've, you know, I mentioned earlier on sticking together your ad tech ta- <laughs> stack with sticky tape. I would just like things to all work well mm-hmm. together. And there to be a simple way to ensure, like, I shouldn't have to be thinking whether that thing works with that thing. But then you you can roll that beyond. I love the ability, like, how do we just get people being connected? And, you know, like, all of that, that power, like, everything that we do is within a broader ecosystem. People, technology, everything. The power of super connection just makes everything work seamlessly together. It connects everything. It's just like, I like... Maybe I'm like the super API, <laughs> like, like everything that, just that everyone's been looking for for all these years, somewhere. right? We've been looking for that for all these years. <laughs> Completely amazing. No, great answer. Um, well, thank you, uh, Matthew, for your time today. That's all we've got uh, time for in today's episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's been great. Cheers. <laughs>